Hi, today I'm going to discuss with you some basics, uh, some must-know blocks, and we're going to talk about nerve blocks above the clavicle. I used to talk about doing an interscalene, a supraclavicular, when I use nerve stimulation. Now the scanning really melds into one. I, I really sort of lump these together. Different uses in terms of clinical practice, interscalene for shoulder surgery, supraclavicular from the mid-humerus down, but really the scanning technique is really the same for both, and that will come apparent as we talk about these uh, through the lecture. So we're going to talk about some of the anatomical variants. There's lots of normals, and you'll see this the more you scan with patients. And some of the ultrasound knowledge for some of these common brachial plexus blocks. Let's see if we can extend it beyond just looking at the plexus. Some of the other structures around there I think are important and interesting to know when you're scanning patients. And also, you know, we'll talk about maybe some of the less common approaches a little bit. But um, let's go back to basic some uh, anatomy and talk about the brachial plexus. So we've got... To really think about here, the anterior scaling muscle, which I've highlighted first. Then think about the middle scaling muscle sitting behind it. Lying on top of the anterior scaling sits the, the, the phrenic nerve. And you can see when you scan up the neck and go to nerve roots, you can often see the fall of phrenic nerve across the anterior scaling. It's really close with interscaling. We're going to block this most of the time, even using 5cc, some of the smaller volumes that Colin McCartney has reported in his fantastic papers. But even with small volumes, it sits so close, we can't reliably miss it. We've still got a chance of hitting the phrenic, it's just so close. Then the roots of the brachial plexus itself. 5, 6, 7, 8 and T1. 5 and 6, probably most important for interscaling, but when it gets down to doing our supraclavicular, we need to make sure we get them all. And the ones you're more likely to miss are the lower roots. Uh, you know, you're going to miss T1, C8, T1 forming the lower trunk. That's most likely missed with the supraclavicular. That's important you know that. How are you going to check that? Well, you're going to pinch the person's little finger, see if they get any changes in their little finger early on. That'll let you know you've got the lower roots involved and your block's going to be successful. After roots, we go into our trunks, a superior, middle and inferior. Around the trunks or the divisions, that is where we are going to um, sort of, uh, do our... Um, our supraclavicular nerve block. One of the most important branches coming off um, is going to be the, the suprascapular nerve. Really important for interscalings. There has been a sort of a train to doing low interscalings or trying to use a, um, a supraclavicular nerve block for shoulder surgery. And this will work if you use a larger volume and you let the volume spread up. But there is a chance with a low volume, low interscaling or, or a supraclavicular that you'll miss an early takeoff, a high takeoff of the suprascapular nerve. Of course, if you want to avoid interscaling, another approach is to, do, to use distal nerve blocks and follow that out and block that individually and even try and block uh, the, the auxiliary nerve. Uh, behind the humerus and doing distal, distal blocks for shoulder surgery is another alternative that will avoid um, these and Darcy Price from New Zealand gives a fantastic lecture and he's got some fantastic articles on how to do this with your patients. But it's important you know that the reason we go high with our interscaling is yes the superior roots are important but also we want to make sure we pick up the suprascapular nerve. So how does this anatomy from the textbook relate into what you see with your patients. Well, on the left image is a, a brachial plexus scan, on the right is a cadaver anatomy. Um, we've got the, we've done the dissection, but we've re-put the flap on there. If we look at the very superficial part, that is the skin, the white line across our, our chart. Next one down, when we flip that off, we can see the subcutaneous fat, and beneath that, we start to see below the fat, the sternocleidomastoid muscle is beginning to appear. So we'll highlight it in red on the picture on the left, and you can see the muscle, the strap muscle, across the neck on the image on the right-hand side. So let's zoom in a little bit closer, and let's look and see what's beneath that. So some fascia covering the brachial plexus. And as we take the fascia off, we start to get a better impression of our two scaling muscles. We can see our anterior scaling muscle, and also our middle scaling muscle. And they're sitting either side of the nerve roots. Now, we can see the traffic lights, one, two, three, lined up on the middle of this image. And be careful here, the traffic lights are not C5, 6, and 7. That's C5 and C6. So the, the one, two, three you see, the three circles in the center of the image, C5, C5, and then C6. That's not C5, 
5, 6 and 7. So that's important because some of the older articles have actually labelled these incorrectly. So you go back to literature and look at some of the articles you'll see these labelled incorrectly. So supraclavicular. Let's have a look uh, at this. Now some people think it's a chip shot. Uh, other people tell you it's a bit of a gimme, it's just so easy. It's interesting, it's a block I avoided doing a classic supraclavicular before ultrasound. I did a subclavian perivascular. I tried to stay lateral and away. So a lot of comparisons about techniques done before ultrasound and what we now do with ultrasound, we're not doing exactly the same block. Alan Winnie, Alan Winnie described the subclavian perivascular approach where you're really going lateral and below the clavicle to do the block and now we're doing it right over the first rib, back to what's described by cooling cap. So let's look at a typical ultrasound image in the supraclavicular area. First of all, it's labelled in white, with a dark shadow behind it, we've labelled the bone. You get a bright reflection of the surface of the bone, and then a marked dropout and hypoechoic, a black shadow behind it. There's also the pleura, and that can be seen on the right hand side of the image. There's a bright line with the pleura, you get a kind of a snowy winter scene appearance behind that. Compare that to the bone, it's black behind the bone and you can get some imaging in the pleura. Now, the lungs obviously filled with air, that's not a great conductor of sound waves, so it's difficult to really discriminate, but you can usually get used to seeing the difference between the first rib and the pleura. Why don't you see the first rib all the way across the image? Well, the first rib kind of looks like a boomerang, it's a horseshoe shape, it's rounded. So your typical picture, part of the image you'll see the rib, other part of the image you'll see the pleura. Black, dark circle of the blood vessel. Much easier when you see a, a video, when you can see the pulsatility of the vessel, but you see the dark uh, artery there. And behind the artery, you're going to start to see some dark circles encased in white fascia. And here we are at the trunks, more or less the divisions of the brachial plexus. Other things we can spot, muscles. Sometimes when you look, the omohyoid muscle can look like a blood vessel. The omohyoid muscle is a strap muscle that's going to go across the neck. Um, you can look for flow. You can also compress it to see if it's an arterial branch, a venous branch. Uh, look for pulsatility in the artery, of course. Try to discriminate the omohyoid from uh, an artery. And that's a common mistake our residents make. I'm not sure which is which. So use the color, use Doppler to help you discriminate between that. And here we can see behind uh, the vessels, the start of the middle scaling muscle. Its origin is on the first rib and as you scan up the neck, the muscles will look an awful lot more uh, obvious and easier to see. But you might see the origin of that just coming off behind the, first, behind the nerves on, from the first rib. So a supraclavicular block, how are we going to do it? Well, we first of all position our patients in a semi-recumbent position. Some people put their patients on their side. What they're trying to do by both techniques, by raising the head up, or turning the patient on their side, is make it easy to see your needle insertion point. If you do this block with the patient's flat on their back, you'll need to go and see one of your friendly surgeons because you'll end up with a bad back trying to see where the needle is inserted behind the probe. So I suggest you turn the, uh, elevate the patient up at 45 degrees. I like this positioning up, sitting the patient up for obese patients. When you give them sedation, you'll often lose the airway. When you sit them up, you manage to lower the chest, lower the weight, make ventilation much easier for the patient. So that I find that's much, much better in, on obese patients, just something to think about. <clears throat> so what we're we looking for, I want to find the subclavian artery on the first rib. Now, back to landmarks here. I commonly see people place the probe too medial. A common mistake, they start scanning the carotid, they wonder why they can't see the nerves. So help yourself. If you feel the jugular notch and then the lateral end of the clavicle, the midpoint of the clavicle, if you place the probe behind there, you'll usually see the artery sitting right there in the middle of your image. So we're back to some surface anatomy. Feel the jugular notch, end of the clavicle, and you'll usually find the artery sitting in the right place. Now, if you don't see it, it might be you have the, the probe too flat and aiming across the neck. If you look at the image in the bottom of the slide, the probe is almost vertical. So if you have your patient sitting at 45 degrees, your probe should be vertical and you'll be looking straight down and on to the artery. So try and avoid having the probe too flat when you look into the neck and make sure it's vertical. 
The other thing to help you obtain an image is slight rotation of the probe. If you're completely parallel with the clavicle, you'll get an oblique view of the nerves. So the nerves aren't very easy to see. Sometimes some rotation of the, the probe in a, in a counter or clockwise direction, particularly to move the lateral side of the probe away from the clavicle. Again, this will give you a more crisp view of the nerve. You then want to see what it's sitting on. Is it pleura or is it the rib? Now, when you start, if you're not sure which is which, my advice is, it's like your mother said, don't cross that line. You can see a bright white line, you're not sure if it's a rib, you're not sure if it's the pleura, just make sure you can see the tip of the needle and do not cross that. The subclavian vein can be mistaken for the artery. So what position is that? Again, it means you're a little bit too medial. What other mistakes can we make when we're scanning? The subclavian vein can be mistaken for the artery. Now this is, where does the vein sit? It sits anterior. How can you discriminate between them both? Well, pressure will occlude the vein. It's compressible. When you put the, the color flow on the Doppler, you see the pulsatile flow of the artery, much more pronounced. But a common and simple sign is, is the veins of valves. If you see something flapping in the middle of the vessel, probably means it's a vein. You don't want anything flapping in the middle of an artery. It's time to see your vascular surgeon if that's the case, okay? Where are the nerves located? They're gonna be located behind the artery. Now, the, from about the six o'clock to 12 o'clock position, you can sometimes see branches that come over the 12 o'clock, lying more anterior, a couple of nerve branches. Uh, they can be bunched up together. They can look like the tail of a satellite. Sometimes it's separated by an arterial branch splitting the plexus. All of these are variations of normal. It's why you want to learn to do different approaches. Don't be satisfied with just the supraclavicular. I'm always wary of somebody who says always or never. I think it's important you learn other approaches because often the, the, the anatomical variance can make this uh, a, a little bit um, of a problem. So we'll see them sitting between 6 and 12 o'clock, dark circles with white fascia around them. More like a bunch of grapes. Up in the interscalian area, we had those traffic lights. Down here, it's kind of more like a bunch of grapes appearance sitting behind the artery. So we're doing this block at the level of trunks or divisions. We go back to our anatomy. Trunks, we've got a superior. This is going to give us the muscutanean, the median, and auxiliary. The middle, the median and radial. And the inferior for the ulnar, the radial and median. So think about those final terminal distributions in the hand, in the forearm. Think of where your surgeon's going to be operating. If it's been somebody who's been in a barroom brawl and they've broken their fifth metacarpal, the ulnar's going to be important. If it's somebody who's getting work done in a thinner eminence in the thumb, well then the median and radial are going to be more important. The ulnar maybe not so much. So you think about, particularly when you do a single shot block, but more importantly, if you're going to leave a catheter in, in the supraclavicular area, Maybe you'll leave it between the middle and the superior trunk, or if it's in the hypothenar, the, the ulnar side, you want to place that catheter between the middle and the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So the ulnar nerve is the most commonly missed. I'm stressing this again. I said at the start of the lecture, we place our local anesthetic inferiorly first. We want to make sure we're placing the local around the ulnar nerve. So we block that inferior trunk first try and place plenty of local down there. We're trying to place the needle as, as close to the artery as we can and on the first rib. So tucked right in that corner pocket. But very often, the local anesthetic will not spread to the middle and superior trunk. And this block often involves, involves a readjustment of the needle position and placing some local anesthetic beside the, the middle and superior trunk. <clears throat> so here's a little bit of uh, positioning. Finding that midpoint position of the clavicle, placing the probe, the probe's on vertical, and all of a sudden I manage to scan and get the artery, the middle of the scan straight away. See the pulsatile artery bouncing away there. So, first things first, a little bit of surface landmarks, and that can make life so easy. If you're unsure, put on the color, and you can use the Doppler to help identify the artery. Slightly tilting the probe backwards and forwards, and behind it you can see this the circles, the bunch of grapes, the brachial plexus just tucked in behind. So with the patient sitting upright, you can easily line up your eyes, the probe and the needle and glance up to the screen. And I think it makes the performance of block much easier. So what's normal, what is not? 
Well, if you actually look at anatomists and when they dissect the brachial plexus, there are lots of variations of normal anatomy. Probably the most common one I see is C5 running through the anterior scalene or even um, anterior to the anterior scalene muscle. I know in the past I could have got a good twitch in the biceps from interscalene and wonder why the block failed. Well, when you actually look at, it, at anatomical dissections, there's plenty of reasons why. Um, <clears throat> C5 and 6 can pierce the anterior scalene or even run anterior. So all these are variations of normal. If you see them with ultrasound, you can independently block these for an interscalene or a supraclavicular, whilst with uh, a nerve stimulation technique, these have been things we missed. The other thing where there's massive variation, probably really important for patient safety, are branches of the subclavian artery. There's the thyrocervical trunk, suprascapular, transverse cervical artery. I don't know which one's which, but I put the color Doppler on in these when I'm doing this block in particular. I've been doing this for 10 years now. I still put the color Doppler on. I can see the obvious main artery. It's the smaller branches that are going to run in the path of your needle as you advance the needle. The other ones I think is important. The top left image, we can see the color Doppler on. We can see the artery arching over the brachial plexus. Maybe this is a case where I'll do an infraclavicular or an auxiliary nerve block. If you look at the bottom image, before and after color Doppler, you maybe have to adjust your needle position, adjust your pro position to do a supraclavicular or abandon it again and go and do another approach. Maybe do an infraclavicular or an auxiliary in this case. On the corner pocket and where the local goes, Yes, I try and place local low in that corner pocket as described in the literature, but I also follow where the local anesthetic goes. I talk about a, a trace back technique or a, a, you know, a dynamic scanning technique when I do this. When you start, it's so difficult to see the nerves. It's so difficult to see the needle. People don't want to move the probe. But to be honest, when I do this technique, yes, I'll place local below the brachial plexus, but I will then scan back up the neck. And I want to see local spreading around the middle and the superior trunk. If I can see the superior trunk surrounded by local, the middle trunk C7 surrounded by local, I'll never move my needle. But after an injection of 10, 12 cc's, there's no evidence of local anus spreading, spreading around the superior middle trunk. I will withdraw my needle and redirect and place local anesthetic around the middle and superior trunk. I don't think it's always good to adjust the needle unless you have to. That's why I like doing a dynamic scanning, building a three-dimensional picture of the brachial plexus. So moving off your needle, watching where the local anesthetic spread, then moving back down to your needle. You know, techniques to improve finding the needle, that's what it's all about when you learn. You want an echogenic needle, maybe using some imaging software. But as you get better, you'll find it easier to step off and refine that needle. And it's a technique that encourages you to use to make sure your local is spread nicely. People have looked at this with the local anesthetic spreads. And Mike Fredrickson is a prolific writer, a great guy based in Auckland, New Zealand. He actually looked at the, um, the, the spread of the, the local. And he compared the infraclavicular and supraclavicular. And he only did the one injection. I, and I find very often with this block, um, I, I have to spread around. Mike and his, he actually said he missed the, uh, when he did this, this study, he missed the, the ulnar most commonly, despite going for the corner pocket. And I see this commonly with beginners. And I think it comes down to scanning. There's two types of patients I scan for supraclavicular nerve block. One group is the elderly patient, osteoporotic, they're coming for, uh, they've got renal failure, they're coming for vascular access surgery. And invariably, I get a fantastic view of the brachial plexus. There's another group, it's the young athlete, younger patients who've got much heavier bone density, particularly the first rib. And I've got an older scan here, it's annotated below the arteries in the middle, the scalenous anterior muscles above and, and to the right of the image and the nerves are behind. I'm scanning on the pleura. In fact, you can see the comet's tail sign, little arrow on the pleura. That's kind of pathognomonic for pleura. If you see that, you can be able to tell the pleura from the first rib. But we're scanning over the pleura, and I can see the nerves quite well. As we actually start to play this and scan down laterally, we're over the dome of the pleura, we're going to slide down to try and make sure we're lateral and over the first rib. As we scan down over the first rib and the dark shadow of the rib appears and less of the pleura, all of a sudden the nerves get more difficult to see. It seems there's such a bright reflection of the first rib that 
quite often what my learners do, the residents do, is they scan further up the neck to get a better view of the nerves. And as they scan up the neck, what happens is they move away from the inferior uh, trunk of the brachial plexus and miss the ulna. So, in Mike uh, Fredrickson's paper, of the 11 failures in supraclavicular, nine were due to missed ulnar territory anesthesia. So, just to recap, normally what people do, they put the probe over the first rib, difficult to see the nerves, so they slide more medial. They slide over the pleura, they get a better image of the brachial plexus over the pleura, but what happens is they miss the inferior trunk. So it's just something to be mindful of. If you want to make sure you improve your success rate, make sure you stay low enough, making sure you pick up a T1 and C8 a nerve roots coming along with that inferior trunk. So <coughs> septic tanks pumped, swimming pools filled, not the same truck they're using, they're talking about in this, this commercial. Um, thankfully not. I, sometimes the supraclavicular doesn't work for you, it might be anatomical variations, it might be the imaging is difficult, but please learn to do the infraclavicular and auxiliary so you've got an alternative to use in your patients. Go on to interscaling. Well, we start scanning the same, same place, same image, I send it as a continuum, but all we're going to do is we're going to slide up the neck. So we've got the artery in the middle, place it, I follow the nerves, and I look for the most superficial branches of the nerves. So when I've got the artery, I can see the brachial plexus behind. What I'm looking for is the most superficial nerve roots. And I'm going to start to scan up the neck. So just to recap, find the midpoint of the clavicle, find the artery, and slowly trace the nerves up the neck. So we're going to translate the probe up the neck, more or less keeping it parallel to neck. So it's very vertical to begin with. As we slide up the neck, the probe is going to get slightly flatter. As we translate up the neck, Beside the nerves, we're going to see the scaling muscles appear. So slowly, going to translate up the neck, and we're going to see anterior to the artery, the anterior scaling appear, posterior to the artery, the middle scaling appear, and we're going to go from that bunch of grapes to the traffic lights where we see the superior and middle interscaling. So just put on the, making it shallow, and we're going to slowly now translate up the neck. So coming up the neck, the muscles are appearing, and in the center of the screen, we shift that more traffic-like appearance. Now, wherever you do the block, I would recommend wherever you get a good image. I find that some beginners trying to go very far up the neck lose the image. So go a little bit lower. Be careful if you go too low. With a small volume, you might miss a suprascapula. What volume to require? Well, I'd say, um, you know, 10 cc's, more than ample. Colin McCartney's showing you can adequate block with 5 cc's. Um, but one thing I want to be careful, you know who you're scanning. I've got a blue arrow in the scan on the left. Those are the, the nerve roots lined up between the scaling muscles. What we're going to do is look a little bit across the right-hand side, the bottom right-hand side of this image. Now look at this. It looks like nerve roots. But when we put the color Doppler on, we can see nice branches coming off the carotid artery. So one reason I like the trace back technique, rather than just sliding lateral to the carotid, is you can be sure you've got the nerves. To a beginner, this could easily look like the brachial plexus. Look at the difficult to see. Use the Doppler, make sure you know what you're scanning. So, Interscaling technique, this goes in a bit of detail. I'm just going to whiz past this. I think the beginner do not do is don't have the probe flat in the neck. Make sure you get the probe vertical. Find the artery, and we're going to go to the most superficial branches and scan up the neck. The picture changes as you scan up the neck. So on the left-hand side, I've got the natural ultrasound image. On the right-hand side of the images is a corresponding one. It's annotated. Let's look at the top two first of all. We see the artery and the plexus behind it. Slightly stepping up, we're going to go to the two images below. We start to see the scaling muscles appear. And also, when you look at the plexus, it's starting to separate. It's starting to separate into a superior and middle and inferior trunk, trunk together. So, but actually, as we go up further, we're going to see the artery drop away. The subclavian artery will drop away. 
but medial, the carotid artery will start to appear. So let's look at the top image and, and this, this is the third of our series. On the left hand side, we now see the plexus splitting up, the superior trunk's on its own at the top, and the, the middle trunk C7 is tucked below. When you go all the way up to where you get that classic traffic lights appearance, often you'll now see an artery. It's a different artery. It's now the carotid with the, with the IJ beside it, and we should no longer see the subclavian artery. So we go through a stage of seeing ar an artery at the beginning, no vessel, then seeing an artery medial at the end. But the vessel is different, so it's just important we clarify that for, for, for beginners. So that perfect image of the interscaling groove is actually only a few centimetres up the neck from the supraclavicular view. They're really only two or three centimetres between the two. I think do the block where you get the, the best uh, representation. It may not be where you see those classic traffic like It might be more a bunched appearance of the superior trunk. I like to insert the needle in plane, but I think it's equally successful if you do an outer plane approach, whatever you're more familiar with. A lot of people have been practicing with nerve stimulation for a while, feel much more comfortable with the outer plane approach. It's a more natural approach for the needle to advance. <laughs> We advance the needle aiming for the plexus, and I'll either plan to go above C5 or below C6. If you draw out the brachial plexus, you know that C5 and 6 come together to form the superior trunk. They want to be together. I don't think stick a needle between them then is a sensible idea, okay? Either below C6 or above C5. Your block will be successful in either of those. I mainly go below C6, just below the superior trunk. What you want to do is look below and make sure you're not putting your needle into C7. At this area, I definitely do not want to go into the nerve roots. Very often, if you look at histology pictures, you'll see a dural cuff around the nerves in this area. So definitely no intraneural injection in this area. Close enough is good enough. You can be a few millimeters away from these and your block will still be successful. Do not go into the dark circles. Stay outside the bright fascia surrounding them make sure you don't cause a subdural or intrathecal injection. So in this case is a catheter. Image on the left shows the needle advanced below C6 and above C7. Below it, we've pulled the needle out, withdrawn the needle, and we see the catheter left between C5 and 6, our superior trunk, and C7 tucked in below our middle trunk. If I do a single shot technique, I don't necessarily advance right underneath C5 and 6. It's good enough just to be posterior. You don't need to advance between the nerve roots. Your block will work fine. If local anesthetic, when you inject, you can only see it posterior to nerve, trust me, the block will work. You do not need to get a donut of local anesthetic around the nerves. It's nice when you see that spread around them, uh, but just seeing the local anesthetic posterior to nerves, your block will be successful. There is a bit of a balance. Are you wanting anesthesia or do you just want analgesia? If you want anesthesia, you probably want to get the superficial cervical plexus as well as the brachial plexus. That's why we tend to use a, a larger volume. If all you want is post-op analgesia, you're looking for the osteotomes, the bone and around the shoulder, the scapula. A smaller volume will get that bony pain, but it might miss, might miss some of the puncture sites or some of the incisional pain that comes from the superficial cervical plexus. So, what are you trying to achieve? Surgical anesthesia or just post-op analgesia? That will often determine also what kind of volume you're using. Another quick tip, if all you want is post-op analgesia, you'll get the same quality of analgesia with quarter percent bupivacaine or quarter percent ropivacaine that you will get with half percent. You reduce your total volume, you'll improve your safety profile just by using that lower concentration. You don't need to go for half percent or three quarter percent for every block. So here's a picture with local anesthetic surrounding those C roots. We can see it spread anterior and posterior in this image. And it's the local anesthetic annotated green on the right just, just to clarify the image. Here's one, a variation anatomy. Here's one you do with a nerve stimulation technique and you realize, hey, why is my block not working? In this case, C5 and 6 are running right within the anterior scaling muscle. <clears throat> We run a little fellowship, time for a little plug, I've talked about above the clavicle, time for a little plug, we run a little uh, CME preceptorship at Duke, two and a half days, only two people at a time, um, come along, you get 22 CME credits for this, you're a Monday, Tuesday and a Wednesday, um, we do some didactics, 
The great thing about this, you actually get to see the blocks being done. You see them done well with the attendings. You also see some of the mistakes that residents make, and I'm sure the mistakes a lot of beginners make. Um, the techniques, some of the images I talked about today are about, about a book that Dave I and I have published for, for Oxford University Press, Ultrasound Guided Regional Anesthesia, and it goes in a lot more detail in a step-by-step -step fashion how to do these blocks. It's a simple, practical handbook. It's not an all-inclusive textbook. There's plenty describing the history of local anesthetics. There's plenty describing how to use an air stimulator. These are simple step-by-step -step guides how we do these blocks. So if you're interested, hopefully you'll find these, uh, this useful. Um, good luck and a happy hunting with your mare blocks.